So the first of these ilipadas, the first of these four bases of spiritual potency is called chanda. And chanda means desire or longing for or will or urge to. And I find the exploration of desire interesting in Buddhism because such a central teaching is around the connection between suffering and craving and the need for the pacification of craving. But what craving refer refers to is this sort of um, ego-based grasping after an experience uh, deluded about its capacity to satisfy us. Whereas chanda is a sort of positive desire, uh, a desire for the path, a desire for the goal of practice, and it involves both uh, ourselves and others. It's for the benefit of both ourselves and others. So Sangharachita, uh, what he said was that in a way the central task or the most difficult task of our spiritual lives is to find emotional equivalence to our intellectual understanding, to engage our emotions with our spiritual practice. And he said that if we, if we want to put into practice what we know or intuit to be right or true or good, uh, we need to somehow enlist the cooperation of our emotions. Um, doing something because it's a good idea, even if we really believe that it's a good idea, uh, it is unlikely to sustain us for very long. We need to be moved by something. We say that we're moved by something when we emotionally respond to it. Uh, so we're looking for this quality of being moved and um, engaging our emotions so that we can make progress on the path in a more integrated, enjoyable and fully embodied kind of a way. And what we're looking for is something like the experience of falling in love. So when we fall in love, we're sort of um, fascinated by the other person. We want to know them more, we want to be closer to them. And they can kind of, particularly in those early stages, they can sort of fill our mind and fill our heart. And I was thinking about um, the Greek god Eros uh, in Roman mythology, he's known as Cupid. And he came to represent something broader than just sex and romance. What he came to represent was this sort of intense um, desire for love of uh, the beloved, uh, of something higher and deeper in our lives. So this is what we're looking for in our spiritual practice, something, uh, something like this kind of quality of longing, longing for something beloved. Uh, and you can think of it like falling in love with the path, falling in love with practice, uh, falling in love with a vision of, of liberation. So Padmasambhava, uh, in the crook of his, um, his left arm, he holds a cat finger, which is a star. And this cat finger that we've got on the shrine behind us uh, is actually a particular one. It's held by the chair of the London Buddhist Centre, so it resides in Surya Gupta's office here. And the cat vanga, it's got quite complex symbolism. It's got three severed heads on it uh, in varying stages of decomposition. And it's also adorned with streamers and skulls and uh, silks um, and other ornamentation. So it's a complex image and I'm not going to go into it all, but what I wanted to talk about is the cat vanga just as the staff, the staff as a whole. So, this reminded me of like um, Poseidon's trident or the magical staff held by various sort of sorcerers and, and wizards and stories and mythologies. And Pavasambhava's staff in particular can be seen as a symbol for the forces of inspiration. It's said to represent the darkni. So the darkni is another figure, uh, an embodiment of enlightenment in the Buddhist tradition with her own um, vast uh, symbolism that I can't go into here. But darkening literally means sky dancer. So we can have this sort of image of the forces of inspiration kind of dancing in the in the clear blue, blue sky of our minds. This is the darkening. And Sangharashtra talks about the darkening as uh, the sort of deepest, most primordial forces uh, of our own psyche and being. And this is what he's saying we need to engage on the path uh, when he's talking about finding emotional equivalence. 
And that what he says actually is that these forces, they need to be uh, integrated and subdued so that our spiritual life is not some pale and anemic thing, but pulsing with life and energy, which I really uh, like. It's a vivid description of practice. And sometimes this stuff is called the secret consort. So um, this, this kind of echoes the metaphor of the lover. And consort, a consort is typically a sort of, um, they're the spouse of a monarch actually, or a sovereign. Uh, so Padmasambhava, you can sort of think of it as like Padmasambhava is married to, uh, he's sort of integrated all these forces of inspiration or his chanda, or his life energy, he holds it in the crook of his arm as a support of his practice for the benefit of others. And then it's called secret, or guhya, Sangharachita says, not because it's hidden, uh, not because, um, yeah, it's somehow deliberately hidden, but more because it's difficult to communicate these matters that are sort of deeply personal and intimate to ourselves, uh, the kind of yeah, the deepest sort of inspirations in our experience, they're very difficult to convey and communicate to another. Inspiration actually literally means to breathe into, uh, so it's a life-giving thing. Uh, it, was it was typically used to talk about how the divine would breathe life into creation uh, or to impart a truth to someone. So it's life-giving and it's to be cherished. And Padmasambhava holds it close, he holds it right right next to his body. He cherishes it. So in practicing chanda, um, this first basis of spiritual potency, uh, we can begin by noticing, uh, noticing and cherishing our heart responses. Uh, notice what calls us, what moves us, what inspires us on the path. And connect with a vision of life, a vision of liberation that engages our desire that we find compelling. And then once we've sort of integrated all of that, once we've, we're holding that close to us in the crook of our arm, then we'll be practicing this first uh, basis of spiritual potency and bearing the staff of inspiration. <laughs>